Aaron Jones is Director of Congressional Relations at the Wilson Center and previously worked on Capitol Hill where he served for eight years in the Office of Congressman Hal Rogers of Kentucky, the Dean of the Delegation and a great place to get a lot of experience with the appropriations process. Aaron, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Appreciate being here. Let me ask you, you first, let's not assume a lot of prior knowledge. Uh, explain the current funding mechanism under which the government is operating and how long that lasts. Sure. So there's uh, basically every year Congress has to go through the budget process and the budget process, really the starting gun of the budget process is when the president releases his budget, which by statute, the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 is supposed to be February 1st. Sometimes it comes late, but generally it's in February. Once that starts, then Congress has to go through and, and start making its own budget. And usually by March or April, again, by statute, they should have something done uh, by April or May. And then by June, the appropriations committees, the ones who actually put the budget priorities into law with legislative text and say the money's gonna go here, uh, that should be really kicked off by June. And then the end of it should be September 30th, which is the, f the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so that is really just kind of in a nutshell the way that the budget process should work. Right. Don't see it happen should often, work. but that's the way it should work. But right now, we're uh, operating under a continuing resolution, correct? Yes, continuing resolution, which it basically kicks the can down the road, prevents a government shutdown, uh, but keeps things funded at the level that they were funded at previously. Uh, so there's no real new funding priorities that are made, but it keeps things running until a certain date that Congress will choose in the future. And we're heading toward that date, at least uh, March 23rd, is that correct? March 23rd is the, the next continuing resolution deadline. Uh, so if they don't have some other kind of spending deal done by then, uh, then they would have to either look at a go another government shutdown or they'll do another continuing resolution. Now, last time we uh, danced up to the potential shutdown, much was made of a two-year budget agreed agreement, and yet we have March 23rd. So w what do people not understand who thought that, well, this was the end of all these continuing resolutions? Sure. So it's important to know that Congress actually does uh, two major budget things. One is that they set in their budget, which the budget committees usually do, they will set the top line spending number. We have a $4 trillion budget thereabouts, and there's about a trillion dollars, a little bit more, that Congress actually has to divvy up amongst the departments. That's called discretionary spending. The rest of it is mandatory spending, which is all, it's, it's all your entitlement programs and, and funding that is set uh, by law that's gonna go directly from the treasury to the people who are entitled to receive it. That's why they're called entitlements. And Congress can't really mess with that. But there is about a trillion dollars that Congress can put to the Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, things like that. And so really that was the most recent budget deal was talking about that. Where is that money going? What's the top line of that money going to be? And so in previous years, because of the Congressional Budget Act of 2011, uh, they had actually set those top line numbers for 10 years. But here we are in 2018, 2019, and Congress is really wanting to spend more money than they said they wanted to spend several years ago. And so in order to do that, they were gonna have to raise those numbers, uh, in those top line numbers. Once Congress has its top line numbers, then the appropriators can get to work. Um, so the top line numbers will really set the ceiling. And then the appropriators will divvy it out and give allocations to each of their 12 appropriations bills. So they have little kind of mini top lines. And then within that, those subcommittees will work and they will say, okay, this much money is gonna go to this project and this program and so forth throughout the government. So March 23rd, worst case scenario is a shutdown. What's the best case scenario? Best case scenario right now is really an omnibus where they will package all of the 12 appropriations bills together in one bill. That's why it's called an omnibus, is all of them moving together. Um, and so they have the new top line allocations. And so, you know, in, in the perfect scenario, they will be able to use those top line allocations to write a big bill that they can push through to get us through the rest of the year. And it will be new, it'll be new funding. So it gives Congress the opportunity to kind of adjust to new funding priorities, things that have come up while they've been under CR. Uh, you know, there's been much made about, you know, defense priorities that the president wants to put in there and a lot of people in Congress want to put in. Uh, that they haven't been able to do when they're doing continuing resolutions. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, not that you're a betting man, but if you were, what are the odds that the best case scenario? 
I think it's pretty good. I, I, I really, you know, March 23rd, you know, here we here we sit at the end of February and March 23rd is still politically a long way away and a lot can happen, uh, particularly when you have other issues uh, such as the DACA situation mm -hmm. and, and what could come with that. Um, but I, you know, in, in the folks that I talk to, it seems like everybody's really working hard on an omnibus and they want to get it done. Now, you mentioned earlier about the starting point of the president's budget. Uh, you know, depending on who you're talking to, that's either uh, the thing that is most newsworthy and that everyone spends their attention looking at or not worth the paper it's written on because there's no power of the purse string over in the White House. It's all on Capitol Hill. How should people look at the president's budget? I think that in today's political reality, the president's budget is really a, a signaling of the president's priorities. It's not really taken seriously as a budget document. Uh, like you said, it doesn't have the force of law. Uh, and neither does the Congress's budgets either. Uh, when Congress creates a budget resolution, it does not have the force of law. It is the appropriators who have the force, the force of law with appropriations measures. So when you look at a president's budget, it's really to see, well, where, is he, where does he really want to put the money? Um, and I'll use an example from the Obama administration. You know, there, there was a budget where he wanted to have a universal four-year-old preschool. Mm -hmm. and, and, and have it paid for uh, through an increase in the cigarette tax. Uh, and there were also cuts made elsewhere in the budget that kind of helped pay for that. It really signaled that he wanted to have universal four-year-old preschool. A statement of priorities. It was a statement of priorities. But when Congress looks at that, you know, one of the things that he wanted to cut was something like community services block grants, which are used all over the country by numerous you know small community action agencies and things like that in rural places especially loved by people left and right mm -hmm. and nobody thought in other congress words, fat chance. <laughs> nobody thought congress was going to cut community services block grants in order to pay for universal preschool but it showed that the president wanted universal preschool and in order to make the budget balance there were some things that he took from other places that he knew Congress wasn't going to, but he, it signaled, it signaled what, well, his, what in, his intentions were. In some ways, it's, you're playing the long game, right? You're, you're introducing this topic into the equation with no realistic expectation that it's happening this budget, but now you've started something and perhaps it can gain traction over time. Yeah, and you also have to think, you know, the timing of, of a president's budget, it's usually around the State of the Union, and so it gives the president a platform to use the State of the Union to say, I'm going to send up a budget that's going to have a robust highway program or yep. universal preschool or something like that. And usually that is what really comes out of the president's budget. It's signaling those top line priorities. And the president has the bully pulpit, as we always call it, right, to use that and say, you know, Congress really should get this done. Having looked at this from the inside and now from the outside, and also being a student of it, what, what do you think about this notion that it's worse than ever, that partisanship is at an all-time high, that the, the business of Congress is, is less effective or, or less competent or less whatever you might characterize it as than ever before? Well, I, I love history, and uh, I wouldn't say I'm a historian, but I have read a lot of, of history, and uh, I do think that if you look at the history of this, of this country, partisanship has really always been there. You can go back to the, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists and, and the fight that happened just over the Constitution before we were even in the system we're in now. And then you could look at Washington's administration and, and, and you had two different versions of how people thought the government should run. And you had people on Jefferson's side of things and Thomas Jefferson wanted it one way and you had Alexander Hamilton who wanted it another way. And so I think that this partisanship and sort of gridlock is sort of baked into our system. You know, the founders created a system where it was difficult to do things in Congress. We have two chambers and you know, parties developed and, and it really was a way that there was always a check on the popular will. Um, and so I really don't see it as being worse in partisanship terms. I do think that there are some things that make this era unique. We have a 24 hour media cycle. Uh, we have social media where everybody can be a pundit, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, and so that that's sort of where people can kind of get into their camps and get into their corners. Uh, it's a little easier for people to do that and sort of self-select the kind of news and kind of information that they're going to take. Um, but I think that in, in the whole, Congress was meant to be somewhat dysfunctional, somewhat uh, slow to act. 
And it's also, you know, when Congress doesn't act, that's also a very powerful thing for Congress to do. When, mm -hmm. you know, when, when a president says, we need to do this, and Congress says, well, you know, our constituents don't really want that. That's also a powerful thing. It's not so much the action always that shows Congress's power. Makes sense. The, the um, trends you identify, what does this indicate as far as what are possible solutions to a, 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 a building a better mousetrap, the people who are frustrated with the way things happen? Do you see anything that's being discussed or that might be a solution or an oh. improvement? A lot of the things that are discussed have really been around for a little while. Um, so, you know, with the pre with the last budget deal, we have uh, this idea of a super budget committee that's going to propose uh, recommendations and legislative text that will fix the budget process. We have a budget process that's been in place for 40 years thereabouts, and uh, that process, which I laid out before. Uh, has not really shown itself to work uh, in the way that Congress laid it out to work. Um, really, and an example of that is uh, Congress has only finished its bills on time by September 30th four times in 40 years. And the last time was fiscal year 97, so it's been a while. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people talk about regular order, you know, really the regular order is continuing resolutions. We've had almost 200 of them in, in 40 years and about 20 government shutdowns. Um, so this is something that people have talked about uh, on Capitol Hill for a long time. One of the biggest things that people talk about is perhaps doing a two-year budget process rather than having to do it every year. Um, and that's something that, um, that has recently come out because there was another bipartisan group that came out with some recommendations and they're really pushing a, a two-year budget deal um, that would you know, be able to move a process and then Congress doesn't have to worry about doing it every single year. And that way it would hopefully alleviate some of the problems of having these constant deadlines. Uh, I'm wondering, I'm going fishing here. I've never asked you about this. The, when you hear family or friends talk about this who aren't expert on it or just people you run into on the street, what are the most common misperceptions that you can help them clear up right now? You know, what are things you hear that just really aren't accurate and really aren't the way things work? And, and give us some insight in that regard. Well, one is that Congress doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could say that, you know, work as in like literally being at work and doing their job. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, having worked there, I know that, that these are people who work 70, 80 hour weeks. Um, so I do, I do think that that is a misconception. Um, it, it is hard, I think, for Congress to overcome that when inaction seems to be what is talked about. Um, and, you know, another thing that a lot of, the, especially in, when you're talking about the budget, people will say, well, why can't Congress just do its job? Mm -hmm. American families have to sit down and they have to do their budgets and everything else. And I think that it's a, it's a good political soundbite to use that. But if you really look at the reality within our households, we have trouble budgeting too. I would not recommend the government run its budget the way <laughs> I, my family runs. We have trouble budget. running budgets too. And, yeah. and, and you know, the number one cause of divorce in North America is because <laughs> of financial reasons. And that's because the kitchen table stuff is difficult too. So if you have a married couple or, or partners who are trying to work out a budget or even a, a single person trying to work out a budget, you're talking about one or two people trying to work out a budget and having a difficult time doing it. Imagine trying to get 535 people to do that um, in, in a system that, like I said, the founders created to have some dissonance. Uh, so I think that it is a misconception that Congress should just be able to do this. Well, people have different priorities and, you know, the things that people in Alabama want are different from what people in California want and different states and different constituencies have different needs. Aaron, you know, the political rhetoric often oversimplifies, but then as you share with us, the actual workings of government, highly complex. Uh, thanks for helping us sort through some of that. I appreciate the time. Thanks.